Hello, everyone. Welcome to 96 Boards Open Hours. This is episode 78. Today is November 9th, and my name is Robert Wolf. We do this show every week, 4 p.m. UTC, nonstop every week. I'm not kidding. Um, the the one thing I will say, which threw me off today a little bit and probably did not get as much PR, at least on my end, was because um, there was a time change in the United States. And so I'm, I, this is usually 9 a.m. for me. UTC is static. It never changes, right? So and for me now, it ended up being 8 a.m., right? So it's an hour earlier for me this time. Now, traditionally, uh, we go through these announcements. And uh, as you can see, Tyler Baker has joined the call. He's our featured guest for today. We'll introduce him in just a moment. There he's waving. And uh, after the announcements, we'll go right into his his uh, his segment. We have a, he has a really cool uh, demo and a bunch of really nice stuff to share with us. So, real quickly, last week's episode was I want to say uh, kind of getting in touch with the '96 boards open hours roots. We did a bit of. Uh, um, of let's see last week's we did a bit of um kind of question and answer just basic discussions hanging out drinking coffee and then i did some coursera announcements so for those of you who are visiting us from our coursera side of things you can um, go check out last week's episode uh, this is all about the new iteration and what we plan on on doing uh, hopefully come the by the end of the year we'll have a bunch of really cool new stuff released now Another thing that's happened these last weeks is we have new blogs, one which is the 96 Boards Pinout, written by uh, Sahesh Saroop, who's in the call here, usually with us every week. And then the other one, which is Automotive Grade Linux on the Dragon Board 410C. Um, this was written by uh, Mani, who is also joining us on the call all the time. Now, for anyone who would like to kind of hang out with us throughout the week, I just want to remind you, we have two. IRC channels where you'll find most of us on here throughout the week, and that's hashtag 96 boards and hashtag open hours. So be sure to visit us there and, um, and, uh, and yeah, and just kind of hang out, right? That's the other six days of the week. That's where we are. Okay. So uh, have fun with us in the chat. There's also all sorts of cool little initiatives that pop up here and there. Now, as always, at the end of the show, I have a community form uh, that we dub secretly as inside dubbing it as the Ragnar form. So <laughs> uh, that will be shared at the end of the at the end of the episode. Great. That's it for today on the announcements. Now Tyler, are you are you ready? Are you there? Yeah, can you guys hear me? We can. We can. Okay. Welcome. I, I think I'm ready. Um, so I did some slides. Figured we'd just go through some slides so I can kind of like give some background about this project and then I can go through all the demos. Does that sound okay? Yeah. So first of all, though, is it, it, on your slides, do you introduce yourself or would you mind introducing bit, yeah. yourself? So I can, I can kind of do that verbally now if you'd like. Um, so I'm Tyler yeah. Baker. Um, I'm formerly uh, from Lenaro. I've joined uh, recently joined a new company called Open Source Foundries. I'm the principal software engineer there. Um, and our kind of focus is uh, providing um, upstream based platforms for Linux and Zephyr RTOS um, that are updatable and secure. Um, so that people can use them on as a basis for products with no vendor lock-in. So that's kind of our idea um, with some of our products. And so what I've done is I've taken um, some of our software output, put it on the Dragonboard 410C, and created something um, that allows me to navigate my boat uh, in the ocean. And so I wanted to share that with you guys today. Cool, yeah, and I just want to add something. I, so I met Tyler back in February of, I think it was February 2016. I had just gotten hired at Lenaro. And I went to the Linux Embedded Conference here in San Diego. And I just want to say, for those of you who have questions today, I, I Tyler is one of the best people at, at explaining things. I've never talked to someone who is so good at explaining things. So if you do have questions, please just interrupt us, interrupt him, interrupt me, and uh, get your questions answered. Yeah. Great. All right, cool. Thanks, Robert. All right, yeah. let me see if I can share and present here if this is all going to work. Uh, let's see, screen share. And do a dry run. Yeah, I'm going to do it at the extension here. Okay, so application window, and I just want you to see. Okay, fine. Let me share that. Let me know when you guys can see this, my screen. We can. 
All right. So let's go into presentation mode here. Perfect. And okay. you'll, you'll share these. You'll share these slides with us after. Absolutely. It's got all the links to the awesome. source code. I figured people might be interested after after uh, that. So, okay. So uh, marine navigation system. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, so. What have I built here? It's uh, microservices for streaming NEMA data on embedded devices. That's really what this comes down to. Um, so typically on boats, um, all the sensors that are on there produce NEMA uh, 183, or I think there's a newer standard now, some of the newer components might be uh, using. And essentially this is a serialized stream of data. Um, and so there's something like a CAN bus on boats and it, it aggregates all this data into a single stream and then something parses it and then displays it on a chart plotter. That's typically how marine navigation systems work. So this one's not gonna be too much different. Um, is there any questions about that before I move on? Okay, so, so the background, why did I do this and what kind of what is it? So the inspiration for this project was drawn from Open Plotter. So Open Plotter, um, is a distribution more or less for Raspberry Pi that that kind of has the same concepts where it's got a NEMA concentrator so that you can connect a whole bunch of sensors to a Raspberry Pi um, and then it will proxy that data um, via NEMA streams to OpenCPM which is Open Chart Plotter um, and it provides you with a pretty good out of the box experience as far as you know uh, being able to just grab a single SD card image sort on a Raspberry Pi and be able to set up a navigation system. Uh, what I found though is I didn't really want to use Raspberry Pi for, for a couple of reasons. It runs on five volts. Um, the USB um, USB couldn't really power all the devices I want to run without using an external hub. So that's yet again more equipment that I need to have on the boat. Um, it was an entire like monolithic image. So essentially, you would get an entire distribution. You'd put it on there, and and that's all its purpose was was being a plotter system. Um, and that kind of seemed like a waste of hardware to me. So I thought there needed to be a more modern way of delivering these same services as open plotter, but uh, maybe in a less intrusive way. So that's kind of why I decided what, to do this. So so instead of putting the traditional Raspbian image on there, you're saying it's a custom image that's just dedicated strictly to open plotter. That you build well, it, no, you not flash so it, and that's all it does. Uh, you'll see. I, I designed it so it's uh, the services that provide the NEMA data, data streaming are, are microservices. So what it does is it decouples the operating system and the distribution from the actual application logic. Because uh, if I wanted to run Open Plotter on something else, I'd have to port the entire, you know, their entire build system to run on a different target. Um, and then there was hard coded stuff like GPIO pins for Raspberry Pi where sensors were going to be. So you'd have to kind of smooth all that stuff out to make it run on something else. And that's where I, I found that it was um, probably not working so well. So what I wanted to do is take each service, containerize it, and isolate it so we could run it. You know, if you just want GPSD to run and you want to use a plotting service, you can do that. If you want AIS, if you want all this extra stuff, you can just simply add that to your platform via containers. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So I'm yes. going to go through all of that, but that's a good question. Um, so what were the goals? Like, what was I intending to do here? I wanted it to be open source. I wanted it to be uber minimal. I wanted everything to be small. Since this is going to be on a boat, if I have to do updates on a boat, I want it to be small because uh, it's typically going over uh, the cellular network. I want to be able to support multiple architectures. Uh, it's fun res running on Raspberry Pi, but I want to run on ARM64 systems. Maybe I even want to run it on x86. Maybe I want to test on x86 in the same way that it would work on ARM. So that was also a goal. Um, making it easy to update and making it robust. Obviously, if this is your navigation system and you're out in the Pacific Ocean, you want this thing to work all the time um, and having it work 50% of the time is just not acceptable. I wanted it to, to easily be able to monitor the services that we're running independently of each other. And I wanted to integrate IoT protocols because I want to add IoT sensing to my boat. Um, and so making sure that there was a path forward uh, with that. So hardware, what, what have I built here? Uh, so I've taken Dragonboard 410C. I've added a, a USB dongle. Now, I know some of you are probably thinking, well, it comes with onboard GPS GLONASS radio. Why didn't you use that? A couple of things. It, it needs um, a special GPSD modification, I believe. Maybe that's, this is no longer needed, but it's essentially specific to Qualcomm. Um, I've actually containerized that version of GPSD, and I run it as a backup to this uh, GPS system. So essentially, I can uh, tell the NEMA streams what priority they should be. And so the Qualcomm GPS actually runs in a container, GPSD from Qualcomm. Um, it doesn't have an antenna, so it's not as powerful as this. Uh, well, maybe maybe it's got a printed on PCB antenna, but it's, it's just not very good for getting locks when you're out on the ocean. So I found the other one's better, but it's a good backup. So it actually will fail over if my uh, 
USB dongle does fail, it'll switch back over to reading NEMA data from the internal GPS radio. Um, and then there's a series of Realtek gear on here. So the first one's a, a TV tuner dongle. Um, they're typically used for the GNU radios project or GNU radio project, which is uh, basically an SDR radio. So you can tune this thing into to any sort of frequency that you want, and you can listen to like AM, FM radio. You can listen to VHF, uh, and you can also do AIS, which is I'll talk about that later. It also has an RS-422 USB dongle. So this, this takes US RS-422 and converts it to a serial stream um, and a serial device on, on the Linux side. So what I can actually do is tap into my existing uh, boat sensors and parse or basically uh, convert their data into a serialized stream and then be able to parse it uh, at a later point. So this kind of allows me to integrate with the existing components I may have on my boat already. Any questions about that hardware setup on the on the Linux side of things? Well, so to have four, these are all USB dongles, you, you have a yeah. little hub added. Yeah. Well, yeah, so I'll show, you, I'll show you that in a moment. It's actually not even a little hub. It's a, well, it is a hub, but uh, it's very, very small. So it doesn't protrude much out of there. So it basically turns uh, a single USB port into two USB ports. And, and the interesting thing is I've had a lot of problems with powering all of this gear, obviously. And this has worked fine. The Dragonboard 410C without an ex, uh, U, external USB hub has powered all of this stuff. Um, and it's specifically what's what's impressive is the SDR radio because uh, once that goes into high speed mode, I, that draws a lot of power. Um, so I'm, I'm very surprised all this this has worked uh, well. Yeah, and I've noticed working in the Raspberry Pi uh, a while back is that sometimes when you start using all four of the USBs that they offer, the Type yeah. A's, eventually something starts to fail. And I mean, even though there is four there, that doesn't mean you can always use four. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, and so that's that's the same yeah. that's the same thing I ran into. And so, like, what Open Plotter recommends you do is like run an externally powered USB hub, and then you got wires running all over your boat. You got USB. I mean, just that to me just felt like that was going to be kind of a nightmare, um, and I didn't want to deal with it. So I, I wanted to find something um, that worked well. So I, I'll go into the software. I, the, the Dragonboard 410C didn't work great for me to begin with without a few modifications. I'll go over that, but now that I've got that dialed in, uh, it works pretty good. So yeah, the next no, so piece I, of this, I was going to say, and I have I have plenty of questions, but I'm going to wait until the end of the, the show. Uh, I have more. Okay, yeah. yeah, I've only got a few slides. I just want to kind of give you guys okay. a background, and then we'll go through the demos and stuff. Cool. Um, okay, so then this other chip that I've got in here. So this is an MCU. It's based on uh, a Nordic NRF52. It's got a few sensors on it. So it's got like a temperature, humidity. Uh, I think it also does barometric pressure. There's an ambient light sensor, uh, accelerometer, and it's coin cell battery powered, or I can power it from external power. And I'll talk about why I have that on board as well. So let's talk about some of the software that I've got deployed on this thing. So um, it's the Linux micro platform from Open Source Foundry. So it's like a minimal Yocto based operating system with container and virtualization runtimes. Um, that's kind of what our, our Linux micro platform is all about, uh, being something very, very small um, that can run these, these different runtimes. Uh, so it's deployed on a Dragonboard 410C. I had to do some uh, customization to the kernel. So I'm basing everything on a 4.4 kernel. I've applied some vendor patches to get the features I needed working properly, which were like uh, SMP, <laughs> Wi-Fi, and USB. Um, also had to enable some of the Docker-related kernel configs, and I'm building an out-of-tree driver as part of the open or the Octo build. Um, which is based on a real tech chipset. But I'll get into why I needed to do that in a little bit. And then the firmware that's running on the microcontroller is uh, our Zephyr micro platform from Open Source Foundries, which is open, secure, over the air updatable RTOS. Um, and so I did some customizations to that. I added driver support in Zephyr for the sensors that are listed on that board. And then uh, I'm setting up the application to stream sensor data over MQTT. And I'll, I'll kind of explain how that uh, publishing stream it's converted into NEMA data here in a moment. But is there any questions on the software side of things before I move on? Well, so I guess I, got, I have I have a couple things. Yeah. So first, I go kind ahead. of want to know, and maybe you go into this, uh, but the overall, there's three questions, I think. Uh, the, the overall time and cost of the hardware. So I'm kind of wondering right. how much money this all costed you in the hardware side of things. Right. Okay. So, so Dragon Ball 410C, what is that? 75 bucks still, right? Um, this thing's probably $15 on Amazon or eBay, maybe even a little bit cheaper, the, the GPS dongle. The TV tuner is a little bit more expensive, about $25, right? 
So, okay, your $35 there, uh, the Wi-Fi dongle's probably 20 bucks, so your $55 there. Uh, RS422 converters are dirt cheap, they're six bucks. So you're probably into this thing like $150 at the end of the day, just for the Dragonboard 410C and all of the um, uh, peripherals on there. Now, I will talk about antennas for doing AIS. You'll spend a lot of money in antennas if you want to do this right. Um, so there is an additional cost there. However, it's worth it. Um, it'll make your life a lot easier. Uh, the NRF uh, 52 Louis board is, I think, $30, and it comes with all the sensors. So you could potentially put this all together, this hardware that you see here, for less than $200 US. And compared to and compared to some navigation system that you buy off the shelf. Yeah, I mean, and, and again, um, you'll get you probably get like you know, forward facing sonar and things like that that are that are kind of out of scope of what I've got here but you're going to spend upwards of 5 to 10,000 dollars US for for a, a navigation system that will provide the same kind and, of functionality and you don't get the the pride of building it yourself <laughs> yeah and, and you'll see when I show you my chart plotter I've got a lot of tweaks done to it and I'm I've got like custom data uh, streaming and so I've got kind of like a custom dashboard set up and I mean being able to customize all that stuff and knowing how it works and being able to fix it if you're out in the water uh, is really nice and uh, it also acts as um, uh, wireless to wireless bridge and I'll talk about that in a second so when I pull into the harbor um, I can configure my dragon board to connect to a, a wireless network that may be at the, the port and then uh, through my wireless network I, I'm able to proxy all that internet traffic too so it kind of acts as a, as a router as well um, so there's a few different roles this thing can play and uh, yeah that's been that's been really handy awesome okay yeah that's that's good I, I mean I, I I'll, I'll save the rest because it seems like you still got more so so yeah, I think I'm getting toward the end of this real quick. So um, and then like I just want to talk about what what applications that I've kind of dockerized. And this these these all applications are bundled with that open plotter, but they're again they come with the entire image, right? So I kind of had to decouple all of the things that it was using in there. So I've got GPSD, which is this the GPS daemon that's you know, provided with uh, most Linux distributions inside of a Docker container, um, and it's streaming GPS uh, NEMA data over a TCP socket. Now why did I choose a TCP socket? Uh, it's because you can have multiple listeners. So if you ever want uh, multiple consumers of that GPS data, you want to use TCP rather than UDP. I don't think GPSD even has a UDP option, but just just to be aware of why I made that decision. Um, then we have the RTL, so it's like the it's a Realtek AIS container, uh, which is meant to tune and decode AIS messages um, from the the SDR radio that we have plugged in. So it tunes into the VHF AIS frequencies, decodes the messages, and then sends them in an email 183 format over a TCP socket again to have multiple listeners. Uh, there's a Wi-Fi AP container, um, and this is kind of cool. So it configures a WLAN interface as a access point mode with host APD. It also will uh, set up the routing tables too. So if you say, uh, all of my interfaces I want to route through, if anyone's connect, any of those interfaces that are connected um, have internet, uh, have internet uh, have an internet routable address. It'll route traffic through there, so you can connect it, uh, you know, dynamically an Ethernet dongle, a cellular modem, uh, and it'll just the uh, Wi-Fi access point will will route that traffic uh, seamlessly for you. Then we've got BT Joiner. Um, this is going to join those NRF52 devices um, over BLE, and then use six low pan. So it's basically going to set up the six low pan interface and then connect over BLE. So we're doing BLE, uh, excuse me, six low pan over BLE. Um, then, then there's a Mosquito container, which is just an MQTT broker, allows me to set up uh, publishing and, and subscriber uh, um, threads there for consumers or publishers. And then Signal K, which is an MQTT to NEMA translator, and you'll see how I use that in a second. Any questions on the, the stack here? And then there's the source code. So all of this stuff's open source. You can reproduce everything I'm, I'm talking about today. Um, and I'll, can, I'll give this to Robert uh, after this episode and we can uh, distribute this if anybody's interested. Okay, so let's yep. do a demo then. Hey. Okay. So can you guys see this? I don't know, I tried to put it on a piece of plywood so you could. I'm gonna pin your better. screen just to. Go. Okay, so this is a this is a VHF antenna. Um, it's connected directly to the, the uh, SDR radio, which is running that RTL AIS container. Um, and then you've got the Realtek 
Wi-Fi dongle here, and you've got the Ublox GPS. I don't have my RS uh, 422 converter in here, but if you look real carefully, this this little hub here, single port converter to a dual port converter. That's what I'm using here. I might actually have another one sitting right over here. Let me just take a peek. No, I don't. Okay. Yeah, if you guys are interested in that, I can I can send you a link um, to how that works. But that seems to work pretty good to kind of load this thing up a little bit. Um, so that's that's it, right? And I've got a couple of pictures that I can show you guys of it mounted in the boat. Uh, one thing, if you're going to do this on your own and you have a VHF radio where you transmit on, you can't, you don't want to use the same antenna. So so ideally, here's what I've read about on the internet. If you want to run AIS, ideally you should have two VHF antennas. One VHF antenna is directly uh, dedicated to your radio, and then three feet away you have another VHF antenna which is dedicated to AIS. I'm a cheapskate. These ex these antennas are very expensive. We're talking about $300 per antenna. So what I ended up doing was buying a VHF splitter, and I, I have a picture I can show you guys of it. And so essentially this line on my boat that comes out of the Dragonboard 410C to go to the antenna goes into a splitter first. And what the splitter does is what, it can detect when there's a transmission on the VHF radio side, and will actually block any of the uh, AIS traffic from going through. Um, and that actually will save your antenna. It's really dangerous if you don't have a splitter to try to transmit at the same time as you're, you're running AIS uh, on the other side. So just be aware of that, that there are some safety concerns there. You could turn into a lightning rod uh, if you don't pay attention to that stuff. Hey, uh, I, any questions I on this setup? So you, you have the, the case where, I mean, you're housing the dragon board in a little bit more of a ruggedized case, or I would imagine, right? Yeah, you're in the, on the seawater. Yeah, so that's been, uh, it's actually mounted, um, so I've got a hard top with uh, like a soft enclosure around, and so it's actually sitting in the hard top um, when it's in there. So I've, I've mounted all the gear, and so basically I just I bring the board in, I plug it in. It runs off the boat's 12 volt power, and so it's all wired into the circuit block with a 5 amp fuse and everything. But yeah, 3D printed a little case, and um, there's a top that goes on this too to keep any, you know, environmental stuff out of it as well. The only problem is, uh, you know, as I debug it, I, I like to put the serial um, serial header on there to do, do some debug every once in a while so i, I will leave it off um every once in a while uh, so then, do you use this is, go ahead yeah go i'm ahead. saying uh what do you use for that uh, for the display of the map and all ah, that's a great now that is a great question so why did i care about setting up a docker uh a, a wi-fi ap so what i basically done and this is what uh, open water doesn't really do it doesn't provide you a way of proxying the data. So all of this thing is going to do is provide the data over TCP sockets on an IP address. And so since it's running an access point, I've got this handy little Chromebook here that I use for navigation. Uh, it's an Acer R13 ARM64 Chromebook. Um, so what I like about it is it's normal laptop, but I can flip it around like this. And now it's a tablet mode. And so I've 3D printed on my boat a little stand for it. So it, this is actually where the chart plotter will run and I'll show you guys how this all works. So there's a, a chart plotter that I mentioned that's open source called OpenCPN. Uh, it's O-P-E-N-C-P-N for anybody that's interested. Um, and that's what's running on here. Now, since this is an ARM64 Chromebook, um, I've got the beta channel enabled. It actually runs as an Android app on here, believe it or not. So if I tap this, this is going to uh, open up the chart plotter so you guys can see that. So this is the chart plotter and this 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 tablet Chromebook convertible thing will connect to the Wi-Fi access point on the Dragonboard 410C and consume the, the the NEMA data streams. And basically, all of that configuration is done right in this little handy menu where I, I specify what the TCP sockets are and the IP addresses for the incoming data. There's GPS, there's AIS, um, and then there's some other streams in there as well. So that's how I navigate my boat with this. And what you will see when this is connected and, and the, the information's flowing, um, you'll actually, you know, it'll center the map over your boat. It'll, um, so with AIS, how many people are familiar with what AIS is? Anybody familiar? I can kind of give a brief. Okay, so picture yourself, you're, you're doing a channel crossing somewhere in the, in the ocean and it's foggy and you can't see, you have very limited visibility. Now you're in a shipping channel, so there's ships that are 200, 300 feet that are just gonna run you over. How do you know where they are when you can't see them? So AIS is an auto, uh, auto identification system. Now there's two different modes. There's a transmit only, or there's transmit and receive mode and there's receive only. And so my AIS system here is only a receive only. So I can consume AIS data, I can't transmit. So most of the big ship, in fact, I think over a certain size, there's, uh, 
marine laws that require you to have a transceiver, an AIS transceiver. And what it does is it basically beacons your position and your, your path, your ship name, your overall length, where you're headed, those kind of things. So that's the data that I'll get back through the AIS radio. So if I'm making a, a crossing through a shipping channel, what will happen is the ships will actually show up as objects on my map here, and I can set inside of OpenCPN um, tolerances. So if I'm within one nautical mile of a ship, I want an alarm to go off to let me know that I, I'm within one nautical mile somewhere of a ship crossing. It can even do some really cool thing where it, it can do collision detection. So it knows your cor course based on GPS and compass. It knows the other boats course based on the AIS data can actually detect when there might be a collision and, and give you another alert as well. How how accurate is how, that? How I mean, I mean, you're talking within a certain amount of feet, a certain amount of. Yeah, so it's so it's VHF, so it's line of sight. So that's why I've got an eight foot long VHF antenna on the top of my boat. So when there's like islands around, if I don't have line of sight, um, typically I can't pick it up. Now, all over the world, there are AIS repeaters that are on land that help you get farther signals and, and move over physical objects. So I've been able to detect boats out 40 nautical miles away from me with this setup, which is pretty comparable to commercial setups. Um, you know, I could run a dedicated AIS, specially tuned AIS antenna, probably get a little bit more um, out of this. But for me, that's fine. It's just more of, I want to see who's around me. And if I'm moving through a shipping channel, I want to see where people are going and, and stay out of the way. It's it's more of a safety thing, honestly. Um, so then, you know, I, I can I can chart, chart uh, like waypoints. So I can select a waypoint and the boat will actually navigate itself. Well, it doesn't have autopilot right now. That's an, actually the next step that I want to add uh, to the system. But it allows me to set a waypoint and basically give me a which direction are you heading? Are you going off course? Are you staying on course? Um, and it's actually, so I've, I've got another chart plotter from Garmin that came with the boat that's there that has GPS. And so I kind of run those two systems side by side, especially when I'm testing, uh, just to make sure that I've got a backup system when I'm out there. You know, I've had, the, like when I first developed this thing, it would crash on me and I wouldn't have any application. And it was kind of like, all right, well, I, I can't have that right now. <laughs> but <laughs> Over the last three months, I feel really comfortable. It, it hasn't, I mean, I've done, you know, trips of 40 nautical miles and haven't had a single hiccup, whereas like the uh, Garmin, the unit that comes on the boat doesn't have GLONASS, so it, it actually doesn't lock sometimes. Like I'll come out of harder and it can't find its GPS position, whereas my open CPN setup here is just rock solid. It's locked in, it's got 24 satellites, uh, it's good to go. So I, I've actually found now, I've got to the point where it's more stable than the Garmin system that's in my boat now, which I think is really cool. Um, so is there any questions about anything that I brought up here? I haven't really talked about like the wireless sensing aspect of this, but I can totally get into that if you guys are interested. So so M Mani has a question in the chat. He says, uh, at Tyler, uh, have you used MCU Boot plus Zephyr for creating the micro platform? That's correct, yes. So uh, for this board, we use our Zephyr micro platform, which consists of MCU Boot and Zephyr. And so MCU Boot's a secure bootloader for uh, MCUs. It does uh, image verification. So all of the application and, well, the application and kernel, there, there's no kernel and application or, or user space with Zephyr. It's all one big uh, unified blob. So there's a kernel and application, and that is signed with a key. And MCU Boot will validate that with the key before it loads it. So if it's the image signature doesn't match, it actually won't update the device. It'll just roll back to the, the previous images. So that's what's really nice about this is when it's on the boat, I can uh, send over the air updates. So if this is if I bury this in my cabin somewhere, it doesn't matter if I have to reflex the firmware. I can send it over six low pan BLE. Can do an HTTP download, uh, put the image down, and it'll check the signing on the image. And if the signing's correct, it'll boot into it. Um, and then if that doesn't work, it'll actually roll back. So it's kind of nice. I can't break this board, uh, and it's it's wireless. So what I'm planning to build next is uh, a smaller version of this board to just do basic sensor stuff. So like float switches. Um, I've got a couple of different like wells for fishing on my boat, and I've got the you know the main bilge. Like I I want to know if there's water filling up in there, obviously. So being able to put one of these down in there uh, inside of a float switch container would be very interesting to me. Um, and then what the cool part about this is this scales really well. So what this does. We've got little temperature sensors on here, and as Zephyr's running, it's monitoring those sensors, it's reading those sensor data, and then it's publishing to MQTT. So if you're not familiar with the MQTT protocol, it's a publisher subscribe protocol. So you publish, somebody publishes data to a broker, and then you can subscribe to those streams through the broker. And so that's kind of how this works. Uh, this sends data back to the broker running on, the, on this guy here via MQTT. And then my signal K server that I mentioned, 
is running in a Docker container also on here that subscribes to that MQTT broker. And so what the Signal K server does is it takes MQTT data, converts it into NEMA, because that's what all the chart plotters read is this NEMA string. And so there's like a whole bunch of uh, different definitions for different sensors under the NEMA spec. So there's like parametric pressure's got its own kind of you know format. And so you basically just have to write the data out so it matches that format and everything gets parsed. And so it's really simple to add new sensing, uh, new sensor data to this system you know, via wireless sensors like this. So this awesome. runs on a coin cell in my boat. What I what I use it for is uh, so ambient air temperature, barometric pressure, uh, accelerometer, and so it's basically my compass. So I calibrate this thing. It's, it sits in the, the basically front hole of my boat and gives me those things, um, and then I display them on my chart plotter um, as data. Is there any questions about yeah, so, the IoT side of this? Go ahead. Well, yeah. So so money brings up a a, a question in here. He says. Are there any plans to use the neon key mezzanine um, for the sensor hub instead of that particular so piece? I, I started guys... with that actually. Okay, but now, so I think yeah, Mani so actually finished room, upstreaming yeah. it into Zephyr. Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah, the, the only reason I didn't um, use that, so I started with it. The problem is the neon will fit on top to the 40 pin um, uh, low speed connector on this thing. The ambient air temperature sensor is sitting right over the CPU. So I'm, I mean, I'm getting like 10 Celsius drifts in temperature over like what I measure with an ambient air temperature like outside. So I actually wanted to decouple the sensing from the board because well, ambient air temperature is essentially a no-go, a no-op uh, when you have it that close to something that gets hot. Um, but yeah, other but than that, it worked fine. It you could throw that. You could throw the neon key on top of a nitrogen. And then yeah, exactly. so I, I used to. Uh, so I think neon uses 3.3 volt level. So I actually had it on a carbon at one point. But the weird part, uh, the, the thing that felt weird for me was I had a Zephyr application. So Zephyr was running on the carbon, and then you know we had some some basic you know bare bare metal RTOS that was running on neon. But it would just kind of be weird to have Zephyr and Zephyr. You know, just basically, if the neon had a radio, a Bluetooth yeah. radio, I just use I use it straight up. But it's just kind of, kind of like too much gear to have running when I could do yeah. it all on a single chip. So that yeah, was the that only reason sense. I didn't use it. But I did start with it. And so I was getting the, the temperature, barometric pressure, the accelerometer, all of that stuff off of the neon directly on the gateway and then just passing it. But I figured I want to get to the point where I can make these things run on coin cells for a year and embed them in the boat and then have all these different wireless sensors. You could put pressure sensors to know if somebody's stepping on your boat. I mean, like the, the use cases for that are, are kind of just all over the place. You can do whatever you want. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, the neon key, it's it's mainly for testing and stuff anyways. Once you get all your concepts down, then you just put it on something a little bit more practical. Um, so so another question came on here. It says, uh, uh, I'm late. This is from Loik. I'm late. Uh, does he use an external USB Wi-Fi dongle or the Dragonboard embedded one or, or the Dragonboard embedded one? And then the answer is he uses an external dongle. Uh, but he wants to know why. So let me, like, let me, let me provide some background here. Yeah. So the reason I'm doing that <laughs> is uh, the WCN36 driver and firmware combination that's currently out there. Um, it works fine when you connect to an SSID. I mean, I, I say it works fine. Like it works. It works reasonably well. I mean, the throughput isn't great. I've had much better Wi-Fi radios, and you know, I've used them and. So I'm not I'm not saying that it's great performance, but it works okay. The problem is when you start using it with host APD, and this goes back to the robustness argument that I made as one of the goals for this project is it just would not stay up. It would crash the kernel. It would lock the device up if I ran if I ran uh, if I used host APD with the WCN uh, Wi-Fi interface. However, I've got uh, the host APD container running on the, the Realtek Wi-Fi dongle that's on here now, providing the access point on both 2.4 and 5.8 gigahertz. I use the WCN radio as a, a wireless to wireless bridge, if that makes sense. So what I do is I use NM command line directly to configure uh, the SSID and the access point passwords that I wanna connect to. And what it'll do is it'll connect the WCN radio to one of those access points, provide internet, and then the container will route the traffic and be the, the router. So it allows me to still use the onboard radio for what it's good for, but not, you know, sacrifice any reliability that uh, that I found. Let me check the chat here and see. Yeah, so I'm kind of curious how, you know, someone wants to recreate this project, going through your instructions and everything that you you're you're going to throw at us through the the slideshow. Do you have an estimate, like how long would it take someone to recreate this project? So, so the biggest hurdle for you is building the Yocto. 
I mean, if you do that from, uh, if you have no cash, I mean, it could take up to five hours, depending on what, what kind of gear you're, I mean, if you like very, very powerful dual core Xeon with 128 gigs of RAM takes me about five hours from a fresh build. If you don't care about rebuilding the Octo, I can provide you pre-builds for that if you want to run on the Dragon board. Um, my kernel's open source, so if you want to move that to something else and you want to use my kernel, that's fine too. Um, so all that's there. I'd say the the rest of it, like the Zephyr Micro platform, I mean, as long as you have the hardware, that's probably a, a five minute job to reproduce the container builds. Oh, that was the other thing I didn't talk about yet, but uh, container builds are a little tricky. So uh, at Open Source Foundries, we're kind of all about using new technology. So uh, in Docker, there's been um, an update to the manifest. What's that? Uh, let me, let me, uh, I think we... he's just open mic. I'll mute him. Okay. Uh, in the V2 Docker spec, there is a provision for a manifest. And what a manifest does is it allows you to specify a um, multi-architecture Docker image, right? And so we've kind of gone down that road. And so all the images, the containers that we built and we published to Docker Hub are multi-arch. And what does that mean? Like, is there, is there a container image specifically for ARM or ARM64 or x86? The answer is yes. But if you pull the latest tag, you're going to use the manifest. So when I, when I, uh, pull these things down, what it does, happens is my Docker daemon talks to the Docker registry and says, what architecture are you? And I say, I'm ARM64. And so then it serves me down the ARM64 image completely seamless. What that gives you is that same Docker command running on an, a Dragon board or running on your laptop or running on a Raspberry Pi has the same effect. The right images get pulled and everything just works and it's a really good experience. Now that's one thing that I've noticed uh, just using Docker on ARM that's a real downside is that a lot of the stuff's built for x86 with no thought on how to get it to how to get it to work on ARM or there's special things that are needed. So the containers that I link you guys to are multi-arch. We build them for ARM hard float, ARM64, and x86, and we link them together with the manifest. So any of those containers that you see here will work on x86 ARM or ARM64. I think that's pretty cool because there's not a lot of people doing it. In fact, Alpine, um, one of the big uh, Kind of the container operating systems just now switched this i think this week to using multi-arch images and we've been using them for almost a year now so we've gotten pretty comfortable with that we really like the experience um and so that's another thing that i kind of saw with like even the raspberry pi and docker is that everybody had these little projects that were specifically for building a docker image for raspberry pi and that's just a waste of time in my opinion if we can't do it so that you know multiple architectures can benefit then um you know you just kind of spinning your wheels in my opinion so yeah, all so, of these containers, multi-arch stuff. That's Go ahead, good Robert. news. So, but so 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 on this note, you know, you've we've already you've mentioned on several occasions throughout the slideshow, throughout the show, open source foundries, right? I mean, I think it's kind of time. We probably should have talked about it at the beginning, but maybe you can kind of give a little bit of a plug, a little bit of a of a background of open source foundries because it seems to have taken a, a played a big part in this entire project right i mean from every piece almost every component yeah well i mean and that's so like what so, is open yeah let me, let me give it a little plug first so open source foundries again is all about allowing you to run the latest upstream software now that's always been scary previously because uh you know there's lots of bugs and people are testing it well and so that's our whole thing is that we provide tested upstream baselines for linux and zephyr that you can base a product on. So we actually do, you know, like product level testing, validation, and we try to keep the, the deltas uh, very, very small. So uh, we have public open source releases and we have subscriber releases. So subscriber releases are like every three days, you get small updates, you get security fixes uh, so that you can maintain a product that you're building, um, uh, you know, and, and base it on upstream software. We're just seeing a, a lot of, a lot of uh, churn in the industry where people have based things on like LTS, kernels and you know forgot about the maintenance the ongoing maintenance that's needed and there's been a lot of security vulnerabilities so we really want to focus on making things secure and and allowing people to update and stay on the latest code paths so that's kind of what open source foundries is about and i think where we kind of take this a step further is that we like to dog food our own stuff we don't just like to say we have this stuff and 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 say oh it should work for a product we like to build um you, you know actual real use cases so like something that you could actually go and bu build and use and uh you know, I, I'd stop in harbors and people come on my boat and they look at this and I can talk them through it and they're like, they, they just think it's so cool. And like another project that we had at Open Source Foundries here I can show you real quick was our, our open source light project. So uh, I 3D printed a whole bunch of these light bulbs and uh, they run BLE mesh. 
So there's no gateway involved. They just it's like a one one node talks to the other node talks to the other node, and you can pass messages through and, and information back through the mesh. Um, and so it's the same technology. The Zephyr Micro platform is the same code essentially that runs on this that runs on this, uh, but they're completely different use cases. And so that's kind of uh, why we've been so heavily involved in this is that we want to show that people can actually build products off this stuff and keep things up to date and keep things secure and, and allow them to be updated. Um, so that's kind of the plug and the idea and the vision and, and why I built uh, this stuff. But uh, aside from me being uh, you know, an employee of open source foundries, this was actually really easy to use. The Dockerized platform, once I got everything uh, building with multi-arch, it just makes it easier because now, instead of an open plotter, where if I wanna change one component, well, I've gotta rebuild the whole Raspberry distribution with their extra stuff just for that one change and then blow my SD card away and anything else that I had running on there to update it. Now it's simply like I can go in there, pick a new tag for my container and run it and everything just works. So that to me, it has allowed me to kind of isolate the components and then I can pick and choose. And so if, if you guys, whoever wants to reproduce this, assuming somebody does, they just say, well, the AIS stuff's like, you know, I don't want to spend a big money on the antenna. Well, you can just get the GPS dongle and run the container and have GPS data going to your chart plotter, which is good enough to, to navigate around. Um, and so it's you don't have to buy into everything. You can just buy the pieces that you want and then kind of build it up your system incrementally. And I think I, I just, I really like that idea. Uh, giving you an easy path to get started with, but then more advanced use cases after that. Yeah, and so uh, touching on the open source foundries a little more, I just wanna say like uh, the, everything that I've seen so far has been amazing. And for those of you who would like to kind of just kind of see a little more uh, you can go look at the Lenaro Connect announcement at Saf in San Francisco from uh, Lenaro CEO George Gray, uh, and I think that even Tyler gets up on stage to do a demo there as well, right? Um, really cool stuff yeah. going on over there. Yeah, and and another cool thing that's going to be happening in January on Open Hours here, uh, we're going to be joined by Ricardo Salvetti, and we're going to do another episode. I think that's more dedicated strictly to open source foundries and some of the light demos and and stuff that uh, Tyler was kind of talking about right now. So there'll be some more interesting things going on around this in the near future. Um, did did anyone else have questions for Tyler? I feel that he went over so many things. I'm surprised that there yeah, aren't I'm more sorry. questions. <laughs> I, I feel that there should be more questions blowing up in the chat. Um, so is there uh, don't anything? Worry. This is part of the problem that, that Open Source Foundries is trying to solve is that look at the complexity. Look at all the moving pieces to get this to where it is, right? You've got your operating system images, you've got your Docker containers, you've got the configuration, you've got the IoT builds, you've got all of that infrastructure that runs inside of this. And so that's kind of, you know, that's the goal is make that easy, right, for people to use and pick up. And so sorry if I kind of, you know, fire hose you guys with all of this information. I didn't mean to, but there's just a lot of stuff going on and I'm, I'm pretty excited about uh, what, what's, how it's turned out. I, I just want a, I just want a button that does everything for me. <laughs> We're working on it. I tell Ricardo that uh, that he's the one that's assigned to that, so he's oh, he's, he's got to make the button easy button. Guy? Oh, yeah. Okay, he's the, he's the easy button guy. Cool. Yeah. So um, I guess let me see. I, I I have some other stuff in my in my document here. Um, I wanted to go over. I guess first you did it over open source foundries. Um, uh, the cost of the entire system. You went over that. Uh, the time it took you to create. The time it took you to create it. Maybe. I, I so I mean I know that it, the the time it it could take to reproduce is building and everything. I guess the time for you to create it. I, I don't know. Like, do you want to talk about that? I mean, well, this is just like a, a labor of love project. So it was over six months. But I first started playing with Open Plotter in Raspberry Pi, right? I mean that's where I started. I was like, ah, oh, perfect. I'll get yeah. Raspberry Pi. I'll get actually all of these peripherals. I bought for the Raspberry Pi. And then I got into it and I was like, oh, you know, I don't want to run an X server on this because the Raspberry Pi, like OpenCPN, part of the reason I run it on the on the uh, Android Chromebook is it needs to have pretty good GPU support. I run uh, the CN93 maps, which are very uh, intensive. So if your graphics stack can't keep up with it, it's a really painful experience to use. And that's what I found with Raspberry Pi. I mean, it, ju it just could not render some of the details of the map. Um, and like, I don't know if you guys can see this, but it's very detailed and it and it loads really quickly and it's cool because it's touchscreen. So like as I'm as I'm driving along, I can just simply like move the map around, right? And check all this neat stuff. So that, that was kind of like, all right, number one, I can't use the Raspberry Pi because the graphics just aren't 
they're just not acceptable enough for me to to, to run as a, as part of a plotter. Um, and so then I started researching. I actually took my Chromebook. I have a, another ARM32 Chromebook, and I tried to take each component and build it separately without the distribution, so I could run maybe all the open uh, plotter stuff on a Chromebook. And then I found out that there's still all this like Raspberry Pi GPIOs, and it's required. This library is required. That's like you can only get it if you're on a Raspberry Pi. And so I kind of got annoyed and, and turned off. So I actually set it to the corner, you know, like the side of my desk for about a month while I figured out what I was going to do. And, and then um, as we started to work on this like Linux micro platform at Open Source Foundries, I could kind of see a path forward. I'm like, if I can containerize all of these services and, and kind of clean them up, then I don't have to be bound to this Raspberry and Pi image um, that's being distributed and kind of do this. So then I started putting it in my boat and I'd still use the Garmin plotter for like everything. And, you know, this thing would crash. And I'd, I actually ran the high key in there for a long time, um, which worked well. But when the problem with high key is, um, I don't know how much you guys have used it before, but there's uh, an issue with the USB stack where it can't allow dual speed mode USB devices. So you can't have a low speed device and a high speed device uh, using the same chip. It's either one or the other, it's either low speed or high speed. So the SDR radio starts in low speed mode. And when you configure it, the radio to tune it to a frequency goes into high speed mode. And so essentially just everything broke as soon as I put the AIS radio uh, on the high key, unfortunately. So I actually spent a little bit of time kind of researching which platforms that I could uh, I could you know get to, to be a reliable state. And I found the Dragon Board was pretty good with some kernel patches um, and was able to kind of create this. So yeah, it's been about six months in the making. Um, and you know, three months of that was pretty heavy, heavy testing heavily, taking it out in the summer, uh, making sure, uh, you know, all works. I, I've actually even tested the, uh, anchor alarm. So when you anchor, um, what you want to do is actually set a GPS, uh, boundary around your boat. So that if your anchor starts to haul off the bottom, you, once it goes outside of that boundary, you're going to get an alarm and you'd wake up. And so actually all of that stuff works with the open CPN and, uh, the Dragonboard 410C stuff that you see here. So it's actually a very, very functional and useful system now. Um, and I use it every time I go out. In fact, I, this was installed on my boat yesterday. I had to go on, you know, go in there and take it all out so I could show you guys. Uh, it was a little stormy. Otherwise, I would have tried to do the the uh, session live on my boat. Um, I don't know how that would have worked, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we would have needed to do a dry run maybe just to see how that would have panned out. So a, a question popped a question popped into the chat here from uh, I'm gonna try to say his name. Guffa 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 guffa. No, he just like he just wrote whatever on his. Uh... <laughs> okay, yeah. So power consumption. Boat battery is precious. So what's the power consumption of the system? So uh, right now, as I run it, and it's just doing this stuff without any. It's about 500 milliamps of current draw. Um, so it's it's pretty. I, mean, I know it's not a measurement of, of how much power consumption. I don't have a kilowatt hour uh, estimate for you, but the current draw is low enough that I'm not concerned about it. Um, now again, it's wired directly to the batteries, kind of like the bilge pump through a fuse. Um, so I think the next step is actually making that power button work. So if I touch the power button, if I if I shut it down and touch the power button, it turns on. If I actually just call shutdown on it, it stays stays off waiting for an interrupt to happen on the button and then uh, wakes back up to keep, to keep the power down. Uh, another thing, I don't have any shore power on my boat. So I can't, when I pull into port, I can't plug in and just have the batteries recharged. So I'm actually looking at a, a solar setup um, for the boat eventually one day uh, that this will all be wired into. And then, you know, that's another use case that I'm interested in for uh, the IoT boards is uh, wireless, uh, I guess it would be like a battery monitoring circuit where I could tell, uh, you know, what my battery voltage is, and then eventually also connected to the solar panels to understand how much energy I'm harvesting as well. Um, so those are all on the uh, on the roadmap for where I'd like to go with this project. I'd be glad to help you out with the solar stuff. I love building little solar projects. That's something I like to do. I have a couple out here in my shed that I just built. Um, but uh yeah so uh the same guy or girl i'm not sure uh, i'm not going to try saying that name again but uh he says uh, uh, point, point 0.5 amps estimate seems a bit low considering all the usb dongles and yeah that does seem a bit low it, it does it does seem a bit low and I, w I was a bit surprised now it's not the greatest uh i'm not like using a national instruments you know like battery replacement monitor to really do this i've got this like inline thing that i put between the battery and the board to measure current so you know, it's not measuring rail current or anything like that. So it's, yeah, I agree. It's probably not that, that big a deal. But I'll tell you this right now. The VHF radio pulls way more voltage or current than uh, this thing does, which is good. So you don't want your radio sitting on your boat all the time, and you probably don't want this running either. Um, so 
yeah, a power harvesting setup would be would be awesome for the boat, so I wouldn't have to worry about that as much. Um, I think even the commercial plotters probably use more um, data. It would be interesting to try to to get that comparison down and just see um, see what that is. Great. So this is kind of coming up on the top of the hour. We have roughly eight minutes left. This is kind of when we start closing things out, though. So. Um, does anyone have any last minute questions before I kind of give out the, the closing announcements, the thank yous? Hey, but it, but, hey, please Turn on but the mic here. Let me see. Will it still be possible to use uh, the HDMI output from the Dragon Boat? Say that again. Actually, Would it still be possible to use the That's HDMI for the plotter? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, there's no reason. Now the build that I'm that I'm producing does not have an X server, does not have a graphical uh, front end on it. But that's, I mean, there's open embedded layers that provide that. Uh, so adding that wouldn't be that difficult to do. Yeah, I, I mean, I suppose I, that was one thing I was interested in. I don't know, maybe you guys have more experience uh, with the Arduino, or no, it's the it's the open source version of the the Arduino. It's Freedrino. That's what it is. The Freedrino GPU stack uh, that that Rob's put together. How well that works uh, with X11 and and how well the performance uh, goes? Yeah, I mean that's that's kind of why I worry because even even fast Android phones struggle with Open CPN. So that's kind of the reason I, I've shied away from trying to to run everything. Plus, it only has a gig of system memory too, and so you're running all these like containers and and it's eating up memory still. So it's a little bit tight, I think, to probably put all that on there and, and have it be useful. Now, not to say that, that like maybe a, a future Dragon Board platform, like maybe an A20C or something like that, would come along and I could actually uh, use that natively, the HDMI natively, and and just have a display for it, which would be great. Yeah, I'd be interested to see that. Um, so, Money comes up with another question. He says, "Can can we avoid the additional patches you've used, like SMP, et cetera? I think there was a few other ones uh, by using the latest supported uh, 4.9 kernel." So I actually tried the 4.9 kernel, and that's why I went back to the 4, 4 kernel. Yes, you can avoid it. It all comes back to the reliability you want, though. Um, I was, yeah, I basically was like, oh, man, there's there's only one core, and USB kind of works on 4.9. You know, like I was having problems with the devices disconnecting. And so I probably could have de debugged it on, on 4.9, but I found that the 4.4 baseline was already in much better shape. Probably because I, you know, for whatever reason, the landing team probably was paying more attention to that platform during that time period. Uh, so things were a little bit more sorted out, um, and that's kind of why I decided to use it. But like our our um, open source foundry's Linux micro platform is based on the 4.11 kernel, and our next release will be based on the 4.14 kernel. So you know, we, we plan on on moving this forward. And once I get to, you know, 4.14 looks good and stable, I would absolutely use that as a kernel baseline uh, in the future. It was more of getting to a point where it's stable. Now I have a stable baseline and I can kind of experiment going forward now on uh, if it's as stable and, and hopefully debug some stuff. So I have a, I have a feeling we're gonna get like an influx of people joining right about now because this is when the people on the West Coast are thinking the show should have started at nine o'clock. Um, but yeah, okay, so here's another question. We'll, 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 we'll keep going, I guess. We'll keep going. As, yeah. Do you have a, a, a few extra minutes there, Tyler, to keep going as long as the yeah, questions no, are still coming? Okay. Yep. Uh, so uh, from Guffa, 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 <laughs> uh, what is your confidence level that your system will survive a trip to Cabo and back without some software or hardware or mechanical breakage due to humidity vibrations, et cetera? It's funny you say Cabo <laughs> real quick because I'm actually going to Cabo on the 23rd. That's my hometown. Um, so, so you bring up Cabo. Actually, I'm, I, I, I go to Cabo a couple times a year. It's where my family lives. But yeah, yeah. I'm curious. What's your confidence level? No, no, it's a good, it's a good question. Um, so I don't know where you're leaving from uh, to get to Cabo. So I don't know how long the journey is. Um, but I haven't taken it offshore before. So I, I actually can't say. Now, I, what I can say is the open plotter project where I'm deriving the software from has been used in sailboats for people circumventing the world for years. So the software is very, very mature. In this particular hardware setup, I vetted it on you know 40 nautical mile trips without a hiccup. Um, and I remove it from the boat when I put the boat back on land. So it's not sitting immersed in you know the salt water. I mean, that's what I think I'm most concerned about is what the salt water in the air will do 
to the components. Um, so if I was going to do a trip like that, I would pot everything that's here um, so that no air can get to any of these components, um, including the SDR radio. All of that stuff would need to be, you know, uh, electrically sealed and from the from the elements. Uh, I think if you're going to really do it. Now, the good news is we don't have a ton of uh, humidity in the north here, so I don't have to worry about it. It's more of dew in inside the uh, uh, hard top of the boat, but. Yeah, that again, I mean, I would I would definitely waterproof this thing if I was going to try to take it offshore uh, or anything like that. So I don't know. Um, it seems good enough to do a 40 mile trip. I mean, I've done probably three or four of these things under my belt, uh, navigated the whole way without a hiccup. So that's as about as far as I've taken it. Now, if you want to try, uh, disclaimers are, I don't know, I haven't tested it offshore. I, I wouldn't recommend you do it until you feel comfortable with it yourself. <laughs> That makes sense. I mean, I think a lot of it would come down to just making sure the hardware becomes more robust. Uh, at, yeah, not the and, hardware, and, but the, the 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 casing of it and the setup, the actual physical setup of the hardware, is more robust. Yeah, and and, and like yeah. this is this is always an, an interesting one. Like, uh, all right, so you put this together, but you know, what's it going to do sitting out in that salt water? For 100 days or uh, 200 days, right? I, you know, I just don't know what the components are going to do. And and everything that I've seen that's on a boat that's marine grade is potted, electrically sealed. Uh, it's sealed from the air. Uh, it just has to be, right? It's got to be made out of like either stainless steel or galvanized, it, it, any sort of metal container. So, I think you would need to do all of that stuff if you really wanted to um, use this. Now, if you've got a sailboat and you've got a hull where things are pretty nice and the environment's pretty nice. I mean, I bet you these components would last a very long time um, inside of there. Um, so I actually know my father-in-law is circumventing the world on his sailboat right now. He doesn't use the Dragonboard 410C. He actually uses an x86 like Atom based system with open CPN and he uses that day in, day out. Um, now that's industrial grade PC versus, you know, an embedded board like this. So there are differences there, but uh, People are using that software with different configurations of the hardware in, uh, you know, very, very um, inhospitable places like the ocean, like South Pacific and stuff. So. Yeah, I, you know, I have to mention this uh, uh, only because we haven't yet. Is it the Dragon Board is not intended for commercial use in s this type of situation, right? So, I mean, the 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 chip itself is not as tested as some other versions of this particular chip on other platforms right now using it for this particular case you're not going to you're not going to see the 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 level of testing that you'll see on other platforms however that doesn't mean that you can't use it and try to go all this go go through all the efforts right but um i mean ultimately you could break down many of the things off of this board or create a derivative or uh, uh find something that's a little bit more industrial grade right Exactly, and that's why I containerized everything because should a piece of hardware become more interesting to me, I'll pull that out, we'll put a new build on that new piece of hardware and then just load the same containers on it, right? And in yeah. theory, everything works the same way. And so that's what I want. I mean, that was one of the goals is just hardware is a commodity, software is the same here. We just pick the commodity we want and we put the software on it and that's, that's the recipe. Um, yeah, but you're right. I mean, finding that piece of hardware is the most difficult Part, especially if you're looking at open source dev boards, because like you said, I mean, a lot of open source dev boards, not just the Dragon Board are, um, you know, they're excess chips. They want to get rid of them. Uh, they want to give them in the hands of developers, but they're not necessarily looking at uh, testing these things uh, like you would with, uh, like a, you know, something that was going to go into a product. Like, for instance, none of these radios are certified on here. Things like that, uh, I would expect in a piece of hardware that was a production quality. Yeah. All righty. So I, I think the questions have have died down, Tyler. I think uh, we're probably ready to close this out. Um, did you have any last comments you wanted to make before I give the um, closing? I just, I just thanks for thanks for inviting me on. It was fun. I, I hope it was uh, insightful, and I hope I didn't bore you guys for 45 minutes. <laughs> no, it was fun. It was fun. I, and, and I mean, like I said at the beginning, you know, you explain things very well. You go into very well, very good detail. So I'm pretty sure anyone who watches this afterwards on YouTube or on Facebook is is going to appreciate that. So thank you very much. And thank you for your time. I, you know, yeah, always no very grateful. You're always welcome back. So if there's anything else you ever want to talk about, please just let, let us know. Great. Will do. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome. So um, then I'm going to give the closing remarks here. Uh, everyone, just so you know, I did share the 
the uh, the form. So for anyone who's interested, I'll share it one more time. Uh, the community form, the Ragnar form, we're calling it, uh, code Open Marine. So if you want to get your community points, hopefully we'll be doing another giveaway soon, uh, maybe by Christmas, I'm hoping. Uh, and that should be a lot of fun. Uh, Ragnar can attest to the intricacy of our swag boxes. Um, I want to thank Tyler one more time for joining us. And uh, next week, so next week on Open Hours, episode 79, uh, getting real close to 100, we're going to be talking with TimeSys. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with TimeSys, I would suggest kind of go searching up on them, reading up a little bit if you want to get to know them a little more. They're doing a really cool webinar series that started on October 28th, and uh, on, I believe it's November 22nd. I will share more information next week, but next week we're going to be talking with some representatives from TimeSys. Uh, they will be talking about their webinar series. It's a completely free, consumable webinar series um, around around uh, all sorts of different aspects of TimeSys, and then also kind of setting focus onto the 96 boards Dragon Board 410C. So for those of you who are interested, I would suggest tuning in next week. There's a lot to learn, a lot to touch on, and uh, we would look forward to seeing you uh, here. So stay tuned. Check out the 96boards.org forward slash open hours website. You'll have a little description there showing up probably on Monday coming up. And uh, we look forward to seeing you next week. Everyone in the call, once again, thank you, Tyler, uh, for showing up here and giving us the, the spiel. Open Source Foundries, Lenaro, 96 Boards, everyone from the community. Uh, we'll see you next week.